Welcome to IdeaGen TV live from Corfu, Greece. Honored to have an incredible panel with me here today, beginning with Tim Ananiadis. Tim, welcome. Tim, it's going to be a great day, isn't it? And it's going to be a great day because you have a lot of great things to tell us. I think that's sort of exactly why. We also have Savri Manusakis from Otis Elevator. You know, ever since I got to know Otis Elevator, I implore all of you to take a look when you're stepping out of the elevator to see, or an escalator, to see Otis, you know it's going to be riding correctly. There are examples where you jump on either an escalator or an elevator and you're like, this isn't riding quite right. And it's never an Otis. So I noticed that. I find it fascinating. Stelios Agapios from Microsoft, welcome. Thanks for being here. I know Microsoft is doing great things. Congratulations on your new partnership with Splunk. I know there's a lot of folks excited about that. And we'll talk a little bit about those issues coming up. And of course, Sergio Fernandez de Cordova, founder and chair of the Public Foundation, working so closely with the United Nations. Thank you for all you're doing with that and so much more. I'd like to go right into this interview and ask a few questions. Maybe we begin with Stavrit. Stavrit, what has been your professional journey and what brought you to your current role at Otis? So it's a, it's a big story, as I, as I already said. So I started my journey after I graduated uh, university um, in uh, the early 2000s. Uh, so I gradually, and I was uh, listening before the, the previous panel, it was very interesting about the woman position, uh, the inclusion, uh, um, and uh, I, I can say that uh, it was my journey, uh, but uh, I'm proud that I belong to a company uh, that it's really inclusive, uh, there is uh, no gender parity. Um, so I have started uh, with the position of sales and uh, marketing manager for Otis Greece and Cyprus in uh, 2003. Uh, I stayed in this position uh, during uh, the whole era that uh, you know uh, Greece uh, was uh, flourishing uh, during the Olympic Games and after. And uh, a little bit after the economic crisis, I decided to move uh, to a PNL position, taking over uh, uh, the general manager uh, position of the Cyprus branch. Uh, following uh, that, uh, I have been promoted uh, to uh, different positions, managerial, general manager, managing director. Uh, my, last, my last position before uh, the, the current one uh, was, uh, was managing director of Western Balkans, the ex-Yugoslavia area. So I was living for several years in Zagreb. And uh, last year I decided that I wanted to come back home. Uh, so uh, um, uh, my company gave me the opportunity uh, to do so and actually to assume a more uh, European MR role, uh, this of the sales and marketing director for Southeast uh, uh, Europe uh, in MR region anyway. Uh, so going back um, uh, to the second part of your question is uh, uh, that I feel excited uh, uh, in every aspect of my role. Uh, I feel uh, that I can uh, give uh, my knowledge to the younger generation. Um, and uh, I really believe uh, that uh, we have very good material to work on, uh, but uh, we, we need to inspire them. We need to empower them if uh, we want them to, uh, to flourish, as I like to say very often. Uh, so this is more or less. Well, and we've had the opportunity to interview Judy Marks, CEO of Otis, um, at IdeaGen uh, on many occasions. And she is, you know what I believe, and I've seen this, and I think you all agree with this, is leaders lead. And what I mean by that is they set the tone. And you can be a servant leader and yet still be part of a team that empowers everyone that works for you. And the four of you are an embodiment of that. Being able to lead is not just pulling people with you, it's going together. And that's the journey that we're on here, is trying to talk about, you know, how do you do this together? How do you lead and be a servant leader at the same time? How are you effective? How do you change the world? Um, we have on this panel 
some of the most brilliant minds on the planet, like Tim Onaniadis. Tim, I want to ask you, why are partnerships so important? You built a career in hospitality, and it wasn't by accident that you were so incredibly successful. Why are the partnerships that you created and were involved in so important? Thank you, George. Uh, for, very kind, but uh, all I can tell you is that uh, actually I was thinking about when we, you know, uh, as I knew about this leadership pa panel that that sometimes we focus on leadership with the people that work for us, not necessarily for the people that they don't work for us and we have to build relationships in order to better other the people working for us, the company, the institution. So partnership for me, it's, it's more important than uh, sometimes uh, whether your, your managerial skills are you know, uh, to the point that they lead the company. Uh, you are the company. You are the institution you're working for. Um, you're working in a men's world and you're able to sell an elevator to an engineer that is a male normally. So your skills have to be, a, you know, the, the skills have to be important enough to be able to build that relationship because they're going to like you first before they give you the opportunity, you know, or even the, the, the contract, right? So partnerships are important and unfortunately, uh, as you go through the leadership roles, a lot of times that doesn't become a, a focus of a discussion of how you're going to be successful. Because if you don't have partners, you, can, you cannot uh, do and uh, uh, create and uh, execute what you want. Uh, the partnership in Microsoft is uh, the best uh, and um, the more crucial uh, thing that happens. Um, our partners is uh, uh, driving the technology via Microsoft and uh, they are executing uh, our dreams, our technology, uh, innovation, everything. So it's very, very, very crucial. Thank you. Um, I think partnerships is a key subset of where we're going tonight. We can't have and build things on partnerships and we're not really focused on making things better. Right, I think that we've seen the world evolve enough that now every one of us or a company or an organization or even a country lateral has the ability to actually execute on everything. We've seen that not really work over the last 75 years. So we're looking at, we really want progress for tomorrow. And, you know, if we really want that progress, then we actually have to focus on partnerships. It has to be made into the DNA, otherwise, um, you know, what are we really doing? Goal number 17 of the Global Goals of the United Nations is all about partnerships. And so these critical partnerships are what makes all of you successful, right? I mean, that's the element of success. You can't do it alone. The UN says it, Secretary General says it, corporate leaders say it, public sector folks say it, and those that think they can do it alone don't go too far often. And so, Sergio, I'd like to ask you on the Global Goals, how do you interpret progress as we're heading into 2030? What does it look like? How do, how, do we, how do we get to the point where we can make progress and actually perhaps achieve the goals by 2030? Great question. Pro right now at the UN and the General Assembly coming up in September, we're actually very focused on what they call the midterms. The midterms really actually happened in, in the early part of the year, but the, this September General, General Assembly is going to be actually focused on every element of progress, partnerships, how are we actually, you know, we walk over, we can cross border, cross industry, cross sector, or are we just talking, right? And a lot of what we focus on is the data, the measurement, the recording. Because if we're not looking at a baseline, then we're not looking at progress. There are many member states and countries and organizations that find progress by revenue. That's not progress. That's progress for shareholders. That's not institutional or community or return on community progress. And there's no way to actually go back to partnerships. Progress is also defined by what are the partnerships you are creating. You know, there's, there's a lot of things that are gonna happen this General Assembly 
where we have two systems in the EU and I won't mention which, that for the first time in 75 years are actually partnering together. And they're celebrating that as progress. That should have happened 75 years ago. Right? And and so partnerships is key to progress. And I think that, you know, we're the, the, the UN is, is sort of pushing this September and the next seven and a half years of sustainable development goals as a focus on baseline partnerships and progress through partnerships. Love it. And and you know, I'd like to turn to Stelius from Microsoft. You know, Microsoft shares an ethos with IdeaGen Global that not many companies that are Fortune 2s, for example, would ever. And it's because of the shared ethos and pathos, two wonderful great Greek words that we truly share, which is why we're presented globally by Microsoft. And I'd like to say that in terms of the opportunity for the sustainability journey that you're on, Stelius, can you tell us what that journey looks like on the sustainability journey? Microsoft is not new at uh, the sustainability journey. Uh, we started this journey at uh, 2009. Uh, our first target is to become a neutral uh, carbon uh, company. And we made it, we succeeded on uh, 2012. On, on 2020, uh, we, made, uh, we set up new targets. Uh, to become carbon uh, negative, water positive, and uh, a net zero waste company. Until 2030, this is our uh, first target. And the second one is uh, for uh, from 2030 to 2050 uh, to remove from the atmosphere all the emissions that we created from our establishment in 1975. You heard that right. To remove all of the emissions that Microsoft emitted, <laughs> created since 1975. That's the goal by 2050. That's incredible. And so I'd like to shift to Stavity because Stavity, you know, Otis is also leading. Again, it starts at the top. We've seen Judy's leadership. We've been in her company, and she's just an amazing global CEO. I mean, there's just no way to describe it. And when you described your journey today, it was striking because you talked about how you feel empowered, how you are leading the way in your own world within Otis. And you know what? That's leadership. You defined it for us here today, so thank you for that because it's exactly what we thought. Um, in terms of Otis's sustainability goals, would you kindly just lay out what those are? The journey of Otis in sustainability, uh, it's a very long journey and it started uh, long before uh, the sustainability discussion. Uh, uh, we started this discussion uh, generally. Uh, so uh, actually it's based on the three absolutes uh, uh, that uh, we uh, have uh, and uh, that is uh, safety, ethics, uh, and quality uh, and actually uh, these are the three absolutes of the company on which uh, we uh, are based uh, the four pillars of our sustainable uh, journey that is health and safety people empowerment government and environmental protection uh, let's say that uh, more or less I will agree with uh, what uh, Stelios uh, mentioned. Uh, we, are, uh, we want uh, to have uh, uh, zero carbon uh, prod production from our factories. Uh, and actually we have achieved it uh, as of today uh, on 47%. Um, uh, uh, but uh, we are not only focused, we are focusing very much on the environment. Uh, our products are environmental uh, uh, sensitive, let's say. Uh, we produce elevators that um, uh, they return the energy to the building. Uh, and actually they are working uh, like a hybrid uh, plug-in uh, car. 
Uh, and this is something that uh, it was a revolution uh, for the industry uh, because uh, this is uh, uh, what we have uh, uh, introduced uh, to the elevator sector and to the construction sector since 2001. And starting from the journey of Eliza Grave Otis uh, 170 years ago, uh, where he was also the first, uh, uh, actually, he invented the elevator, the safe elevator, are, uh, are part of uh, what um, we, uh, we say that uh, this is. Uh, so we are. Uh, uh, we're thinking of a connected world, of a connected world of elevators, of a connected world of elevators that uh, will reduce the transportation of our mechanics uh, from job site to job site, and uh, that they will give the opportunity uh, to the people that are entrapped or they need uh, to have a solution to the callback of their elevator to be done remotely. As you were speaking, Stavdi, I recall that Judy mentioned the number that's just it's staggering. Right. The number has changed. It's actually two billion people per day over this elevator. And that's also those escalators. For those watching, the escalators are just as important as the elevators. Believe me, when, they, when, it has, when you're going through an airport and it goes up and it goes across and it goes down again, that's not an Otis. That's not Otis. Because I've been on there with my luggage and it's not fun. So. I want to commend you on everything that you're doing with Otis because two billion people is just remarkable and you're doing it right with great leadership. Tim Ananiadis, you are chairman of the board of ACS Athens. An incredible, and, just a, and you know, I'm on the board with you, I honorably serve. Tell us a little bit about how you have come from the hospitality industry and now you're involved in education. How does that even happen? First of all, uh, hospitality and education are, you start from, no matter what your education is, you start from the bottom and you work your way up. You learn everything, you got coaches, you have people teaching you. Uh, you, uh, you always have to update yourself because in, you know, especially now. Um, but more importantly, I got involved uh, with ACS because both of my kids went through there. I felt the responsibility to give back to the school as part of our sustainability program, if you want to call it that way. So uh, although my kids graduated from the school, uh, a lot of us on the board are actually uh, still involved because we feel that the school gave the skills to our kids to be successful. So we feel that we have to maintain the school because the school doesn't have ownership. The school is basically the board and the administration. There is no uh, corporation, it's a nonprofit. There is no, no nobody, not, not an individual owner behind it to support that. Uh, so we are, we are the ones that actually, uh, you know, are responsible for the, 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 the future success of the school. Uh, and having said that, thank you very much for being on the board because it's a responsibility. The board's responsibility is fiduciary, but it's also uh, uh, to ensure that financially the school can survive because there is no major benefactor behind it supporting it. So thank you very much for that. Um, I wanted to say something about the, you know, the, the discussion about leadership that we talked about and sustainability. Um, I, I think that the, uh, uh, a true leader anymore needs to be aware of not the typical, you know, everybody thinks of sustainability energy, they're thinking, uh, you know, you got to think of sustainability giving opportunity, giving, uh, uh, giving a, 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 a work-friendly environment for people to be able to uh, uh, to grow within your system, to grow within your environment, because that's, that's also part of the sustaining humanity. The global goals of the United Nations, 2015 to 2030, we're halfway there. And so today we have a global panel. We're sitting here in the historic Ionian Parliament building on the island of Corfu, with co-hosted with the former European Union ambassador to the United States and so many others that have spoken here today. It's remarkable to hear from so many global leaders and luminaries talking about 
their vantage points. Their vantage points, local change for global impact, which is the, the title of this summit. I'd like to ask you and start with Sergio. What are the takeaways? What are the takeaways from the conversations you've heard today? Because you've heard a lot of conversations. What are the takeaways for the United States? And what are the takeaways for Europe and beyond? I think um, one of the, the takeaways as we have the mayor here today is it's all about the local community. Right? You have to, it's, it's the old knowledge and all politics and all the right? All impact is right? not just politics, right? And all innovation is the top down approach is not really the work. And a lot of the work that we do on technology, innovation, and data is actually how to bring this innovation from the bottom up. It's no longer a top down. So the Mali conversation, it is a bottom-up approach because these economies need this innovation. The schools are dying to allow these students to have a future that isn't leaving the country, right? And you need leaders like the mayor that was here today that are saying, hey, you know what? We are bringing this innovation here. We want to bring it. Right? Doors are open. This happening here is an example, right? And, and it's just not just about, you know, core food, but really what Europe is, is yearning for overall. Every country in Europe, we've been around, everyone is saying, please bring your innovation here. We have capital, we have culture, we've been around for a few thousand years, right? You come here and, uh, you know, most of the innovation that has made the real world today has come from Greece, from, you know, all throughout the region. and. And so I think that, you know, it's exciting, but, you know, uh, for me, why I came here, because I uh, you know, love the work that you're doing, and, and bringing the different stakeholders together, because this conversation needs to happen. Europe, America, innovation from Silicon Valley, innovation from universities, from corporates, from companies that have been around and that are doing things around the world. Right. We all need to come together. So again, I go back to, yes, partnerships, so local, and we need to develop. Uh, we have a motto in Microsoft that uh, uh, do more with less. Uh, with technology, we can do more with less, uh, less, uh, less energy. So we have to, um, to use technology to, to make our world better um, and uh, to change our way of thinking, way of life, our personal life. And this is uh, and what I'm, I'm taking today from this uh, great conference is that uh, we have a lot of work to do. We have to do more. Okay. Yeah, technology, technology is a driver. Te technology is a driver and it's in our hands uh, to change the world because uh, we want our children and our grandchildren and uh, all the people to, uh, to, to survive. I can see uh, what is happening right now, for example, in Greece, the wildfires. Uh, how these are affecting our ecosystem. Every year it's the same story. Every year we're trying as a company to reforest. And again, the same and the same. Uh, so we need to work all of us together. Um, as Otis, uh, we are trying to do our best in terms of, env of our environmental footprint. Uh, but that is not enough. We have to educate our people. It has to start from school. Uh, it has to start from the, uh, it has to continue with the university, it has to be inside the companies, otherwise uh, we're doing nothing. Um, sometimes uh, wonder, we care, we care, we have to show that we are not uh, just, uh, as I said, selling sustainability. We want to be there and change the world. So. Um well, I, two, two takeaways. The first one, it was on our panel, which I, you know, I was uh, taken aback of how much accomplished athletes are having a hard time getting into the professional world uh, or men's world, which was, you know, you, you don't expect that as much because when you look at it from the outside, it's a totally different, you know, you see the glossy pictures, you don't see the struggle within it. The second thing is, for the U.S. and for Europe, uh, the, that their major tourism uh, 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 sources for you know for places like Corfu, uh, those people, those local people here, they struggle. 
to be able to create sustainable programs, to be able to protect their environment. Uh, they have to choose between having tourism or not having tourism in order for them to survive. Uh, and I think both Europe and the U in, uh, in UN and uh, in the US and, and China now, and you know, because they're all made, you know, bring millions of people out to these places. I mean, this place here goes from 150,000 to a million and a half in a two-month period, and that doesn't count the, you know, the, the peripherals. So I think that we need to pay attention to how we can support the local governments and the local smaller companies to be able to, to, you know, to, to uh, have the programs that they need to sustain their environment. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to travel here 10 years from now because you're not going to have clean water to swim. So thank you. So what's, what's striking is with Microsoft, for example, to empower every person on the planet to Microsoft in Greece, billion dollar investment in upskilling a, a country the size of Greece and Europe. That's a commitment to changing the world, right? Because how do you do it, Tim, with education, right? Upskilling, reskilling. You know, in America, we have, what, 8 million jobs that are going unfilled because we don't have a match between the labor and the skills. And so Microsoft is helping to lead the way. It's, it's, it's a fact. Otis is moving 2 billion people a day. I can't get past that stat because I'm all about stats. I'm in Washington, so it's all about numbers. And I'd like to just end with this question to you all. I've asked this question to the thousands of people I've interviewed. It's sort of a simple question, so it's a way to close the day with a profound moment. And it's, what is one key lesson? You all are accomplished. You've done a lot of great things. What is one key lesson you have learned that has the potential to change the world? Sergio. I think uh, from my perspective, I think it's better policy. I think uh, public-private partnerships is, uh, is key. And to me, that's just really like the core of evolution. If we don't have both of them looking at where their future is going, we're going to continue to have what we have today. So the public-private partnerships. Uh, to understand that uh, we have a problem, uh, we have a problem for uh, the, the next big thing uh, in nowadays in, uh, for the next generation. Uh, so we have to understand and to collaborate to solve the problem. Collaboration. This is the most important thing I think that I can repeat it a couple of times today. People that showed me the way, of course, it was for me if I will follow or not. But I think that I had very good teachers. Why? I always start and end with education. Education is the cornerstone of everything. Humility as a, as a leader, but also that will bring uh, opportunity, education, and access to health care for the rest of the world. Because if we don't have that, you don't have anything. And that's the final world. word. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you.